from us during PCI, it's a formidable challenge to the interventional cardiologist who has to deal with the possibility of abrupt breast closure and hemodynamic instability, distal embolization and no reflow, stent thrombos both acutely and in long term. So we all know that anticoagulation and antiplatelets are key determinants of complications during PCI and adequate anticoagulation and potent dual antiplatelet therapy have greatly reduced but not eliminated the occurrence of ischemic complications during PCI. But mind you, these therapies alone will not compensate for the suboptimal technique. In a large North American registry, 73% of table deaths in cath lab are the result of de novo formation of intracoronary thrombus. What do you, how do you define a large thrombus? A large thrombus is a filling defect whose length is greater than or equal to twice the vessel diameter and it is found to be a fundamental factor for adverse clinical outcomes including 30, increased 30-day 30 mortality and high rate of impact-related artery stent thrombosis. According to Timmy, Timmy thrombus grading, a large thrombus is graded as a grade 4 or a grade 5 thrombus. Fortunately, in the last 10 years, we didn't have any cases where there was a large thrombus formation during PCI. But I would like to show some settings wherein the thrombus, pre-procedure pre thrombus burden was high. And this is the first case. Patient present with a acute anterior MI. As you can see, the proximal LED is uh, totally occluded with thrombus. And uh, after 2B3A, the distal, the distal extent of the thrombus can be visualized. So, when you, ex can, you can see the distal extent of the thrombus, do you still want to go with the thrombus section or do you want to directly stent it? We always prefer to go with the direct stenting and this is what has been done and uh, Timmy 3 flow has been established. So, in our practice, what we really do actually is, once the distal extent of the thrombus is visualized, we try not to take any, any devices, either a thrombus section or a balloon dot ring or a balloon dial inflations, all these should be avoided and probably then by avoiding the distal thrombus fragmentation and distal embolization and preventing the angiographic no reflow situation. This is another acute MI patient where the ostium of the LED is totally occluded with thrombus and the ramus also has an 80% stenosis in the proximal segment and the biggest challenge here is avoiding the migration of the thrombus into the left main and the ramus. So again, as I said, after 2B3A and wiring the vessel, when the distal uh, extent of the thrombus could be visualized, then did a direct stenting to the LED and then stented the ramus and could come out without migration of the thrombus into the left main or the ramus. Just to mention about the angry thrombus, it's an angiographic clinical term, a situation in which unique pathological and aggressive thrombus accumulation happens and this complicates VCI in thrombus containing lesions. This can occur at any stage of coronary interventions and once it forms, it rapidly aggregates at the target lesion and beyond, frequently protruding proximally and distally deeply into the treated vessel. So, I would like to show this situation. This is a patient with acute inferior MI where you can see the RCA is totally occluded with the thrombus in the distal RCA at the crux and the thrombus extending into PDA and PLV. And uh, here after wiring both the PDA and PLV uh, and 2B3A, thrombus action was done and you can see the thrombus clearing in the distal RCA but the thrombus is still there in the PDA and PLV. So, at, in this sort of situation, what are we going to do? Are we going to leave it on 2B3A infusion or you want to visualize the distal bed by doing a balloon dot ring or you want to stand both the PDA and PLV? So, here the balloon was taken and dot ring was attempted and you see what has happened. See, you see the propagation of thrombus into the mid RCA and then that was patient, but patient was stable so we backed out from that. Uh, continued the 2B3A infusion, gave low molecular weight heparin for another 2-3 days and a check angiogram after 72 hours shows that the distal RCA has totally cleared from with thrombus and uh, there is a bit of thrombus in the PDA and PLV which uh, is left for medical management and uh, check angio after a few weeks. The next subset I would like to show is a patient with an acute stent thrombus. Here the patient again present with inferior MI. Patient is a CKD patient, came with acute inferior MI and RCA shows near total occlusion in the mid RCA with, thr with thrombus and patient did not receive 2B3A in this, in this setting as the patient had a duodenal ulcer and gastric erosion which were diagnosed a few weeks back. So we thought we could probably get out. A direct stenting was done, everything was fine and patient was pain free and once when we were planning to ship the patient out of the cath lab, she developed chest pain, bradycardia, hypertension and check and you showed acute thrombus in the stented segment. And again 2B3A infusion was given and balloon dilatations within the stented segment and Timmy 3 flow was restored. So we all know complex angioplasties, complex procedures, 
They increase the procedure times and complex techniques for complex lesion subsets like CTOs, where the use of multiple guide wires and bifurcation stenting these days, and all these increase the procedure time and the risk of thrombus formation. And also use of advanced diagnostics like IVAS, OCT, FFR, they also increase the procedure time, number of wire exchanges, thereby predisposing to the increased risk of thrombus formation. Other, other situation that I would like to say is, the, my plaques which are unstable, they may be disrupted unintentionally during the procedure, like with guide catheter related, it could be a guide wire related or balloon or stent related. Here I would like to show a pro patient with unstable angina where the LED shows a proximal tight stenosis, bifurcation lesion, where angioplasty with stenting and protection of the side branch has been done. And But as you can see in the first slide, the mid and distal LED didn't have much of a disease, it was a mild plaque. And once the wire was taken out, as you can see in the distal LED, there is plaque which has raised, the disrupted, and then thrombus formation there. And we had to stent it and could come out with a good result. So how to avoid this sort of thrombus during PCI? It should be by appropriate selection of accessories, with a proper appropriate guide catheter, the chance, chances of left main and RC osteal dissections can be avoided and thrombus can be avoided. And uh, the extra care should be taken while handling coated wires and stiff wires. In presence of large thrombus burden, as I said, balloon inflation alone should be avoided to avoid the risk of thrombus fragmentation, distal microembolization, and angiographic no reflow. Thrombus aspiration using dedicated devices and direct coronary center is always recommended. How to avoid iatrogenic coronary thrombus? Keep equipment del well times to a minimum. Wipe down all the exteriorized equipment before reintroduction. Flush introducer and guiding catheters frequently and thoroughly. Load unfractionated heparin before PCA equipment is used. Keep ACT more than 250 to 300 with regular checks. And if concurrent 2B3A is used, 200 seconds is acceptable. Use weight adjusted heparin dosing. Apart from these, pharmacotherapy, antiplatelets and anticoagulants are the mainstay in preventing thrombus. Dual antiplatelets like aspirin and clopidogrel, articagrel and prosugrel along with unfractionated heparin have been the mainstay of standard care. In the setting of ACS, especially STEMI, 2B3 infusions have prevented the thrombus propagation and no reflow. Thank you very much.